Wildlife filmmakers expose themselves to angry and fierce animals. Travel to remote areas, risk life and limb to capture amazing images. Here are some of the most exciting wildlife encounters on film. Cameroon, Central Africa. Here in the wildlife center, there is a gamekeeper you certainly should not copy. Chala. Come, chef. Very good fort. Alfred Bama feels at ease playing with the adult gorillas, the most powerful great apes on earth. Afraid of close contact? No way. He joins in even the roughest tussle. Anyone care for a bout of gorilla wrestling? My brothers, and they are my brothers. That's why I'm playing with them. He's playing. <laughs> you see that they really love me. I mean, they are playing and they are very happy. I think my relationship with this gorilla is because all the time I spend all my time playing with them. So I mean, they always see me here every day, every day. So I'm, when I'm playing with them like this, they are so happy because they really love me and they trust me. And he trusts them. Alaska. Wide open spaces, sparsely populated, rich in animal wildlife, and home to 50,000 grizzlies. The wildlife filmmaker Andreas Keeling has known many of them for several years now and wants to introduce his son to his hairy acquaintances. It's strange, this female bear just won't leave the valley. She stays here all year round and feeds on grass. He knows just how to handle the grizzlies. If I approach a grizzly using a calm voice and talking to them, they realize I'm no threat. Even so, caution is always recommended. Young bears are especially keen on hunting and it's hard to tell its mood from its expression. But this one's in a good mood. Andreas is particularly keen on filming the grizzlies catching fish. Salmon fishing is a challenge for the bears, even though the fish are plentiful when migrating upstream. Andreas is ignored. The bears are in fish fever. It's evening, and now Eric has an appetite for fish. Bring him in, but be careful you don't snap the line. It's a big one. Success. Your first salmon, super. While Andreas is taking underwater shots, Eric cuts his fish, unaware that he's being watched. It would be an easy catch for the grizzly, who has been lured by the smell of fresh salmon. Eric is completely on his own. A tricky situation. is cool. The extra strong pepper spray scares the bear away. Are you okay? Yes. 
father and son decide they'll be more careful in future. But for now, they'll sit down and enjoy Eric's well-defended catch. And? and? Just the way it should be. The islands of South Georgia, a hostile place in the Antarctic Ocean, buried beneath glaciers. The air cools over the massive ice plains, creating fall winds which dry out the ground. An arid wilderness remains. Restricted by tight valleys, the winds gather speed. Gusts of up to 300 kilometers an hour lash at the coastline. But this bizarre environment is threatened by global warming. The Argentinian glacial scientist Jorge Strelin is documenting the changes in this icy world. Here, in this glacial arch, he hopes to find information about the ice movement. A dangerous place to be, even for the experienced. Jorge slips and falls more than six meters down into the icy waters. It's only after being swept along for 400 meters that he can free himself from the tearing current. He's safe and has only a few scratches to show. A few minutes longer, and he would have paid for the expedition with his life. Jorge is lucky. He has gathered valuable information to take back home. Information that will help scientists understand more about the climate change. Greenland. Here, nature is harsh and hostile. This explains why the Inuit call upon metaphysical powers by the Tupilak to help them. The wildlife filmmaker Uwe Anders accidentally broke the legs off one of these figures in a museum. Things have been going wrong ever since. A meltwater lake caved in, flowed beneath the glacier. Huge chunks of ice broke off. We kept filming until it was too dark. We'd already packed up all our stuff, and I said I'd go to the spot we'd been to check if we had left anything behind. When I go back to my assistant, I can see from his expression that something's happening. I turn around and see a 30-meter chunk break off and fall. We started running. If I'd been there 10 seconds beforehand, the ice blocks would have got me. Perhaps the Tupilag didn't get me, because he had no legs, it was too slow. On his next Greenland trip, Uwe is certain to give the Tupilag a wide berth. The Namib Desert borders on the South Atlantic. On the coast there are seal colonies. These are what wildlife filmmakers Thomas Behrendt and Birgit Peters have come for. Their track leads them along the notorious Skeleton Coast, where whale bones are scattered along the beach. Up to now, everything has run smoothly, until one of their jeeps tips over onto its side. Everything okay with you? Your knee's shaking. What's up? Thankfully, no one's been hurt. After the initial shock, it's time to get the jeep back upright. Everyone has to lend a hand. 
Peter, how long do we have? Peter, is enough time before high tide? One and a half hours, then we have to be out of here. Then the jeep will be flooded? Yes. It's a race against the incoming tide. The heavy off-road vehicle starts slipping away on the soft sand. The sea keeps on rising. They manage to upright the jeep just in time. Now it's full steam ahead. They want to get away from the coast. The seal colonies can be reached via the overland route as well. The Thai forest on the Ivory Coast, the largest connected area of rainforest in West Africa. Wildlife filmmakers are here under the dense treetops to find the shy pygmy hippopotamus. As unique as these pictures are, Cameraman Klaus Scheurich nearly paid for them with his life, since rainforests conceal life-threatening dangers, tropical diseases. At Christmas, Klaus became really ill and contracted malaria. We treated that, but the medicine didn't agree with Klaus. That was the day after my birthday. We'd had a day off because we'd celebrated the evening before. And then in the morning, we had just been chatting. I turned around for my book, pick it up, look back at Klaus, and there Klaus is. And he's dying. He looked like a terrible actor in an awful film. With his tongue hanging out and wheezing, the malaria was now really serious. The medicine he was taking prolongs the heartbeat intervals. A few people have died like that. We knew this, but we didn't know why. I really thought, he can't die here. How would I get him out of here, out of the rainforest and back home? How would I manage the funeral? Those are thoughts that cross your mind, you know. And in the meantime, you're doing everything in order to prevent the worst-case scenario. Anyway, I reanimated him. I've no idea how long it took. He came back to life, but the whole day he was... You saw it, how his eyes kept rolling away. So you had to keep on encouraging his heart to beat. And it worked. It really worked out. It was great. I simply fell asleep and she kept waking me up. <laughs> and the day was awful, of course. I was down with fever in my bed. And the bed was in a mud-walled hut. It was no fun. But it was only afterwards that I started shaking. I was in shock. I curled up in embryo position and shook. Yes, that was a bit awful somehow. <laughs> that really was awful. Yes. So wildlife filmmaker can be a dangerous job, even if the animals you are trying to film are harmless. The Scheurichs had to wait months for these shots because there are only 3,000 remaining pygmy hippos in the whole of West Africa. The Thai National Park is one of their last refuges. If it isn't protected, these might be the last images of wild pygmy hippos captured on film. Every year, gigantic herds of new cross the heart of the Serengeti in search of fresh grass, this precarious migration promises fantastic material for the wildlife filmmaking team. The news hesitate before crossing the river. They can sense hunters lurking nearby. Using a special camera, Ivo Nuremberg hopes to capture super slow motion pictures of crocodile attacks. In the meantime, Oliver Goetzel positions his normal remote camera to get close-ups of the news. To check that the image section and focus are correctly adjusted, Oliver puts himself into typical new position. 
That's good. The team watch what the remote camera is filming in suspense. That's what we want, to see them splashing around. The news aren't keen on the loss of privacy, though. It looks OK. I didn't dare to hope. If the lens hasn't been kicked, it's still in one piece. Wonderful. All as well, it, it's intact. Oh, look at that. The remotely controlled camera has passed the new test. To recover from the shock, they look at what the super slow motion camera has filmed. The attack only lasted a second. Too short a time for a normal camera. He can't be seen, well camouflaged, shot directly out of the water. The special camera films this action in up to 2,000 pictures per second, and a motion sequence never seen before is captured. Hurls him into the air and he bites into empty space. It's really great to see how the water is churned up in front of him. <laughs> Even veteran filmmaker Reinhard Radke is thrilled. spend the next couple of days in a camouflage tent on the riverbank and in the vicinity of crocodiles. I don't really like sitting in a camouflage tent because you have no alternative when something happens elsewhere. You just have to stay in there all day and wait for something to happen. But you get shots which would otherwise be impossible because the animals are merely meters away from you. A good camouflage means unforeseen risks. You wouldn't believe how big an animal is when it's only one and a half meters away. You have to keep calm and keep your nerves under control, which is hard enough. It seems the elephant hasn't noticed the tent. He's getting closer and closer. This could end fatally. A bit of luck is what's needed here. A successful day comes to an end. Pleased with their work, the team put up their tarpaulins. Nothing else to ward off intruders. Wildlife filmmakers often have to use the regional method of transportation as these both do in the swamps of northeast India, in the Kaziranga National Park. Their goal, the Indian rhinoceros. But they have to keep a safe distance from the giants. Rhino mums defend their offspring against intruders resolutely. Since rhinos always use the same route when searching for food, the filmmakers position their remote control cameras there. They hope to get close-up shots of a mother and her baby. She senses something fishy. She does a good job of destroying the camera. Thank goodness it's a remote control. As quickly as she is attacked, she also calms down. 
a baby is safe. After all the excitement, they need a refreshing lug of Brahmaputra water. The coast of South Africa is renowned for shark attacks. A group of scientists want to find out just what triggers these attacks. On board, filmmaker Thomas Behrendt and his colleague Birgit Peters. They begin their experiment. The scent of bait should attract the sharks to Walter, their diving pal. How would the great whites react? Will they be more interested in Walter or the fish? A moment later, the first one appears. A human being would probably have just noticed the shark and would be panicking. But Walter stays cool, of course. The shark inches his way forward. He dares his first bite. Exploratory bite, as it's called. It's only the fish the shark wants, but because of reflections on the water's surface, he misses them and bites into the dummy. Finally, he does manage to get the bait and swims away. But how do white sharks react to real humans? Supported by the South African shark expert and long team colleague Andre Hartmann, Thomas braves the sea water. For one and a half decades, Thomas has been diving amongst white sharks. They both want to dive deeper to see how the white sharks will react to them. Most encounters have shown that, in general, sharks react indifferently to divers. Today is different, however. They are being observed by the same shark who dared to approach Walter a few minutes ago. A second shark appears. And then a third. The situation becomes unpredictable. White sharks are by no means loners, as previously assumed. And all three are interested in Thomas and Andre. Without warning, one of them attacks. Actually, Thomas should always have an eye on them, but with three sharks, that's impossible. The moment he looks in another direction, one of the sharks takes the opportunity. Fortunately, Andre reacts immediately and shoes him off. Wow, you didn't see what almost happened behind your head. <laughs> one thing is clear. When divers encounter a white shark, they have to keep it in view or it could be dangerous. So much in the life of the great whites is yet to be discovered. In order to live in accord with them, man must learn to understand them better and respect their habitat. That, in turn, would lead to less accidents. Norway, land of fjords and the northern lights, rough and untamed. That can also be said of the musk ox. The 300 kilogram heavy bulls in particular can be very dangerous if they feel threatened. The camera team is watched suspiciously, but the bull's rutting fights are more important.
Even so, the animals remain unpredictable. Nature filmmaker Jan Haft keeps his distance. If a musk ox is irritated, you practically have no chance. There are no trees, the trees are minute, dwarf birches, you can't climb them. So what do you do? The musk ox is considerably faster, so you have to avoid any conflict. Taking close-up shots is definitely not recommended. We positioned a small remote control camera and hid ourselves 50 meters away. Along came a young bull, and this young lout saw something dodgy. And all of a sudden it went click, and he got angry. He started to butt his horn into it, but butted into the ground next to the camera instead. Then he managed to skewer it. The camera rolled over and stopped somewhere. He leapt up behind the camera, snorted as if he were cross at using up unnecessary energy, and then he trotted away. When he was gone, I went over quickly. I had no idea how close he might still be. I thought it unlikely that he would come back again, but if he had, I'd have been only a few meters away from him. Due to his courageous effort, Jan took these exceptional close-ups home. Andreas Keeling is on his way through North Canada. He manages to get close to a lone musk ox. The filmmaker is already really close when his dog, Sita, starts getting excited. The musk ox stays cool. Seen from his perspective, this tiny creature poses no threat. But the noise is somehow very irritating. Now, that was a feigned attack, but Andreas takes it as a warning. Sita, on the other hand, just won't give in. Before the musk ox changes his mind, Andreas begins retreating. The East Siberian island of Wrangel. Musk oxen frequently visit this rustic abode. Uwe Anders can't resist this ideal opportunity. However, at dinner, he and his colleagues discover that the musk oxen aren't their only visitors. Oh, oh, I think polar bear is coming. Why? But come in this direction. How many? I think only one. Oh, he's coming very close. Let's go to the front door. The more polar bears there are on the island, the more often they turn up on the doorstep. When it's suddenly right in front of you, that's a dangerous situation. When you have to pee, there are no toilets in the buildings, you have to go out into the tundra. And you should take a good look around, because polar bears move noiselessly. So when you go to the loo in the tundra, you have to take this rod with you, a roll of toilet paper and this rod. Curious bears can cause a lot of damage. Window panes in particular are prone to breakage. A bear in the house. That is lethally dangerous for the inhabitants. That's why windows and doors, the house's weak spots, are barred up with robust wooden planks covered with nails. But even these don't always help. That's why it's good to keep polar bears at a distance. 
The fewer polar bears you have in the place, the better. It's a latent danger. To unexpectedly come across a polar bear sleeping in a semi-derelict house and you're passing by and it suddenly comes out of it. That's a situation you haven't prepared for. Keep the risk low. Together with Ranger Alexei Bezdobukov, Uwe decides to drive out the intrusive bear. You try to make it clear to these polar bears that this place might become uncomfortable for them. For this purpose, the rangers have rifles which fire really bright and loud bullets, and also rubber bullets. At first, that scares the polar bear, but he runs only a few hundred meters away and then carries on as before. He notes, if he has his wits about him, next time, give that a wide berth. It isn't as if the bear is treated cruelly. Of course, Uwe would rather film polar bears in the wilderness on Wrangel Island. Why does he dare to search for these mighty beasts when he is unarmed and in an open vehicle? At the end of the day, it was obvious that the polar bears were much shyer than expected. So the problem wasn't that they came too close. It was more the problem of us simply getting close enough to them. One typical situation, a polar bear is asleep in the tundra, and you can get quite close to him. You can get within 30 to 40 meters, and that's what we did. And the wind was in our favor, so he couldn't smell us. We sat down really quietly and set up our equipment, but made a small noise even so. His head popped up, he saw us, and ran off straight away. Once he was behind the small hill, however, he had to take a look. The famous Saguaro. This gigantic cactus is the characteristic landmark in the Sonora Desert in the southwest of the USA. From its white flowers, you can tell that the monsoon will soon begin. Finally, after months of drought, the first drops start falling. These regularly recurring summer rains are the secret behind the richness in species. Nowhere else in the USA can this many cactus species be found. The cool rain brings relief for the wildlife too. But then the soft rain turns into a torrent. The nature filmmaker Jan Sokoczewski doesn't want to miss this. We wanted to film the torrential monsoon. Jan knows going outside could be lethal. It's well known that things made of metal, such as tripods and cameras, attract lightning. It's best if you position yourself on the mountain, something you shouldn't really be doing. You don't really want to go outside, do you? We've lost two or three cameras due to lightning. Jan's commitment is rewarded with these archaic images. Illuminated by stroboscope flash, everything appears even more menacing. His pictures illustrate the gigantic dimensions of the torrential rainfalls.
You can't just stay in your car. You have to go outside. For some desert dwellers, the water proves life-threatening. This Californian gopher tortoise has crept out of its underground den so it doesn't drown. When it rains, the desert becomes a place of raging currents for one hour or two. Jan could easily be swept away by the water masses. The water pressure is extremely high here. Your cable's hanging in the water. It's broken anyway. <laughs> It would look really great if I went in there, but I don't know. After the downpour, the desert inhabitants start reappearing. We wanted to film a roadrunner moving in on a rattlesnake to see if it's edible. Roadrunners feed on rattlesnakes. But this one is decisively too long for him. Where is the snake, Jan? Somewhere here. It was here just a moment ago. Then he got through there. Is it gone? No, we'd have seen that. Our cameraman, he's been bitten by a poisonous snake before. That's why he wanted to wear these special boots. He didn't want to repeat the experience. This guy's safe. No one can bite into that, that's for sure. They can bite into it, but nothing will happen. The shins are well protected. Hopefully. The poison from one bite would be enough to kill thousands of mice. Nevertheless, Jan is set on getting close-ups. You really want to see them close up, and for that we use a small finger camera, which you can attach to a rod. Because as a cameraman, you don't want to put your head there. The risky operation is rewarded. <laughs> you couldn't have filmed that better even with a big camera. Beautiful. It didn't react to the camera. That was the beauty of it. It came up really close. It wasn't in focus anymore. Probably saw its reflection. Pleased with their booty, the wildlife filmmakers call it a day. The federal state of Karnataka in southwest India is home to the rare sloth bear. What's unique? Here you can film the nocturnal animals in daylight. But before filmmakers Oliver Goetzel and Ivo Nuremberg begin shooting, there are time-consuming preparations to be made. Our Indian friends are building a tower for us, which will later be camouflaged. It allows us to film the plateau behind that rock, where we hope to film a mother with her two young. Their lair is over there, and that's why we have to be able to film over the large rock. The tower is being made by a locksmith in a neighboring village. A week later, it's finished and has only to be erected. That's a gigantic lever. Unthinkable what would happen if the steel construction collapsed. It's slipping. Go in there, further back. 
Steel on steel is extremely slippery and hard to handle. A crane would have made the installation safer, but they are a rarity in this remote region. We've got one, only one. After much discussion, the leaning tower is almost upright. Sir, sir, balance. Balance is... You think so? Yes. Thanks to many helping hands, all has gone well. The operation has been completed without casualties, though it looked rather dangerous. The tower is standing. That's wonderful. It stands and doesn't wobble. Evo and Oliver can do without wobbling because that would create blurred images. Everything is ready for the entrance of the sloth bear. Its teeth may look frightening, but to defend itself, it primarily uses its crescent-shaped claws. During a break, Oliver notices that Indian plant life knows how to defend itself too. Because of those horns, Evo has Evo, do you have tweezers? In the guest house. In the guest house, yeah. Look at this. <laughs> This one nearly went through, and one did go through, snapped in half, and that bit is in my foot now. Even shoe soles centimetres thick are no obstacle for this type of thorn. I just pulled it out with my teeth. It was stuck in my shoe. It completely disappeared into the sole. One went through and broke, unfortunately, and is in my foot. That bit, the tip. Why on earth do you look like that? I hopped here. I hopped for two kilometers from the toilet. What? <laughs> shoes. Yeah, you should not sniff on those shoes. Deadly poison. <laughs> Evo, I really don't need to hear your silly commentary. Maybe you Perhaps you could give me my shoe. <laughs> oh, oh, it stinks. Hello, those are feet. They work hard every day. And they shower every day. I don't dare walk anywhere now. These things pierce through everything. If I'd run, this would have gone completely into my foot. But because I was only walking... Can we go now? Do sloth bears get thorns in the soles of their feet? This is a question Evo and Oliver had to leave unanswered. After they had filmed at the entrance of the cave, they wanted to film directly in the cave. A bit of noise. First of all, they have to make certain there is no one at home. When surprised, sloth bears are quick to attack their long claws in India, they cause more mortalities than tigers and leopards put together. Oliver is quick to notice this crevice in the rock is more suited to a contortionist. But if a bear can fit through it, so can he. Okay, if a camera. It's a really tight squeeze. However, a few bats live here, and I love them, as is well known. And this is a wonderful spot. What to be a bear? Oliver's gymnastics have been worthwhile. That's such a beauty cave. 
Wow. Together with his Indian colleague, Ashima Narayan, he looks for the perfect picture. Isn't it a nice position? You have all the main camera. That's so beauty. Yeah, and the light the is light. so nice. Yeah. <laughs> so now you're in the movie as well. <laughs> Oliver will have to squeeze through the crevice every day now in order to get the film material and recharge the batteries. The filmmakers have gained a fantastic insight into the family life of a bear mother. Suddenly, a curious male appears on the scene. The she-bear isn't having any of this. Even though he weighs twice as much, when encountering so much verve, he decides to retreat. Sloth bears certainly prove that they have a fine grasp of things. The following morning, Eva and Oliver want to take aerial shots from a hot air balloon. Oliver is a trifle queasy. Right now, just as the sun is coming up, we've discovered that we're standing in a cemetery, which means we're launching from a cemetery. I can't believe it, my stomach's churning. This isn't a good omen. A few years ago, while on location in Russia, the two of them crashed with their hot air balloon. Eva was badly injured. Even so, nothing holds them back from their attempt to capture the long-desired shots. Thankfully, it's ideal ballooning weather. Beneath them, the bizarre rock landscape of Karnataka unfolds. All of a sudden, there's a problem. The burner has gone out. The gas is contaminated and is blocking the nozzles. The balloon pilot has no other choice than to make an emergency landing. This will be hard. Do we hang on the Don't worry. The pilot is more or less unscathed and runs to Oliver's aid. He's not in a good way. He's not getting any air. Thankfully, after a while, his breathing becomes normal. I thought we'd be badly injured. When I looked at that rock, I could see quite a drop. If we banged against it, we would have fallen 30 meters vertically downwards. Hey, do you want to get back into a balloon? <laughs> of course, even after two balloon accidents. The team has only suffered a little shock, 
Oliver has sprained his elbow and bruised his chest. Evo and the pilot only have a few scratches and light bruises to show. See, luckily, you don't hit it. A blessing in disguise. If they had bumped into the tip of this boulder, the balloon journey would have ended fatally. Very dodgy transportation, wild animals, the unpredictable powers of nature, an ordinary day in the life of wildlife filmmakers who want to be where the action is.